grave. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, so welcome this morning. We're going to start our first lecture on dark energy and modify gravity. So before I get there, um, so it's going to be a very theory-oriented uh, course uh, based mainly on field theory techniques applied for the development of dark energy and modified gravity um, models. Uh, we're not going to go too much on the observational constraint, but I'm going to tell you how we can uh, shield these different type of models, how they could be possibly consistent with current observations without actually going through the data and, and proving that in detail. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a few motivations. And it's going to be very quick before going into the um, core of it. So we know this is our cosmological picture of the evolution of the universe from a few seconds after the Big Bang. Um, uh, there was a period of inflation, and I believe you have a whole lecture series on inflation, the effective field theory of inflation. What we're going to be concerned about today is not the acceleration, accelerated expansion that happened at the very beginning of the universe, but rather uh, the second period of accelerated expansion that the, the universe is currently undergoing. So very recently, we, we had some, well, for the past 20 years now, we have very strong evidence that the evolution of the universe today is, um, is accelerating. So the, the, the data come from 20 years ago or more, but it was just a few years ago that the Nobel Prize of Physics, 2011, was given to this gentleman for observations of supernovae that told us that the universe is currently expanding uh, and accelerating. So the, I'm just going to show you a few, a few quick slides on uh, how, how this worked, what the physics behind these uh, supernovae observations are, and how from these supernovae observations we have some strong indication that the universe expansion is actually accelerating. So a supernova is an explosion of a star, and one of the key things with um, this type of supernova is that they have a characteristic spectrum and luminosity. And so from having uh, its luminosity and from the luminosity of its uh, uh, embedding galaxy, we have some notion of the distance from, of, this, uh, of this object from, uh, from us. Uh, but also from its spectrum, and in particular from uh, the fact that its spectrum can be shifted by kind of Doppler shifting, we have some strong indication of the, how, how fast this... Uh, but in galaxy, his, this, uh, uh, this object is moving away from us. So if we had <laughs> a supernova right now <laughs> in this room, hopefully that wouldn't happen, uh, this is the typical spectrum we would expect uh, for, this, uh, for this object. Uh, however, if the object is moving away from us or towards us, it's going to be shifted, and which way it gets shifted depends on whether it moves towards us or whether it moves away from us. But in most cases, it's moving away from us, and what we observe is a shift in the spectrum. And so directly by analyzing the shift in the spectrum, we can see, we can have a good indication on how fast the object is moving from away from us. So this is the level of the redshift. We're just comparing. Uh, we see something at a wavelength of 420, for instance, when it, sh uh, when it should be at 400. So we can get what we call the redshift Z. And from the redshift Z, we get directly the speed of the object. Uh, to be roughly 0.05 as compared to that of light. So it's moving at 5% of the speed of light, it would look like. Um, and so that corresponds to a speed of, let's say, 1.5, 10 to the 4 kilometer per second. So it's huge. It's huge. Of course, not every object is doing like that. Uh, it depends on the distance of the objects away from us. And it's also uh, an average uh, effect. But if we make a, a map of... Um, this supernova and other objects in the universe on what their redshift is or what their velocity um, away from us of that order of magnitude, it was 1.5, 10 to the 4, before uh, as a function of the distance it is from us, we see, we see a trend like so. And see, so this really tells us that the universe is expanding. It doesn't mean that we are in the center of the universe and everybody is away f going away from us. It really means that that's not the picture we believe in, but it really means that every, at every point in the universe, what we perceive is that all the objects are moving away from us, wherever we are in the universe, and so that means that the universe is expanding. We're living in an expanding universe. 
So this is the picture, the hot Big Bang picture, where there may have been an explosion at the very beginning of the universe, and, and we're still within a period of expansion in here. And that's just dominated by what the, the fluid was, uh, was doing. But we're living in a world which is essentially gravitational. There's the force of gravity, and so even though the object started uh, in a universe in expansion, the universe is expanding like that, the object started moving away from one another, we would expect in the end of the, at the end of the day, the force of gravity to at least to, to slow this expansion down uh, a little bit. So maybe there could be a phase of contraction at the end of this expansion, or at the very least, we would expect this expansion to slow down. Maybe not to get reverted, but at the very least to slow down. So if we go back to this Hubble diagram, and we, we try to understand what it means to have a universe which expansion will slow down, it would mean that um, if we're looking at very far distances that corresponds to what happened um, before, much earlier in the evolution of our universe, in the history of our universe, and so if the expansion is slowing down, we would expect that um, what we see in the past would have been a higher expansion of the universe, a higher expansion rate. So if this is what we see at the moment, it roughly looks like a straight line, uh, if you believe that. But if you look at much larger distances, you would expect uh, if we had a deceleration, if the expansion is slowing down, that objects much further away from us would move faster because today the expansion, we see this deceleration. Today the expansion would, be, would not be as fast as what it has been in the past. So that's what we would naively have expected, but what we actually observe is quite the opposite. The objects were slower actually in the past, which means that the expansion of the universe is more rapid today, so which means that the expansion of the universe is actually accelerating. And so that corresponds to the second phase of accelerated expansion in the history of our universe. Of course, the scale the scales involved during this new phase of accelerating expansion in the universe are much smaller than what happened during um, the period of inflation, and we'll, go, and we'll go through that. And nowadays, there's some strong evidence on um, the fact that the universe expansion is currently accelerating. So supernova is one of them. These are evidence from supernova that indicates that the universe is uh, accelerating. And sourcing this acceleration is some uh, kind of fluid that we call dark energy. So in this plot, we're not gonna, uh, the, this dark energy could be a cosmological constant or it could be something else. We just, by this terminology here, we're just indicating that there's some source that makes the expansion of the universe accelerating. And then there's also some mass, which is made out of the standard baryonic matter that we know of, that we're made out of, and then also maybe all of the dark matter present in the universe. So the key thing of this plot is to show that uh, supernova indicates the existence of dark energy that makes the universe expansion accelerating, but you, we also have nowadays very independent type of observations that all converge towards that observation that the universe is accelerating. So these are observations from the cosmic microwave background, and this is from baryonic acoustic oscillations. We see that these type of observations are quite independent. The physics involved is quite different. The scales involved is very different. Uh, and yet they all seem to converge towards that point in the concordance model of cosmology, where the universe is dominated by some type of fluid, around 70%, something like that, which makes the universe expansion accelerating. And so you've probably seen that pie chart before, where we see that in terms of energy budget today, it is, uh, the universe is dominated by around 70%, 71% of dark energy, 24% of dark matter, and the standard Baryonic matter that we know of only makes out of roughly 5% of the energy budget of the universe. And typically, this is sold to us as being one of the big puzzles today of why so much of the universe, 95% of the energy budget of the universe, is made of dark stuff. We need to understand this dark stuff. But what we'll see today, though, is that while this is surprising that there's some dark energy, what is even more surprising is that it doesn't dominate more the energy budget of the universe. Very naively, from a particle physics perspective, we would have expected to have much more vacuum energy, which leads to something called dark energy, which leads to an accelerated expansion of the universe. So we'll have a look at that today. Um, 
But in parallel, well, we'll see today, and you probably know, that this 70% uh, of the universe uh, energy project that leads to a, a, an accelerated expansion could very well be uh, corresponding to nothing other than a cosmological constant. Um, and a cosmological constant was something that was introduced by Einstein from the very, well, not from the very beginning, but uh, was introduced in Einstein's equations. So these are just tagged in a, <laughs> in a wall, a graffiti in a wall, we would say. Um, the Einstein's equation here with so the curvature, the Einstein uh, tensor in there, and on the right-hand side, uh, the matter component present in the universe. And, uh, uh, yeah, uh, so very early on, at the time, so that was 100 years ago, um, it, it was believed that the universe was roughly static. There wasn't this notion of the evolution of the universe from the Hubble diagram yet. And so that was bothering Einstein the fact that if you have some matter present in the universe, it will automatically lead to uh, an evolution of the universe. And so his original idea was to introduce a cosmological constant so as to make the universe static, so as to compensate the effect from the matter present in the universe. So while this, in principle, could happen as a particular solution, it's actually a very unstable solution because if you add a tiny little bit more matter, then it would make the whole universe collapse. And if you add a little bit more uh, of a uh, uh, cosmological constant, it will make the whole universe actually expand and, and accelerate. So adding a cosmological constant is not a very good solution to making the universe static in a, in a stable way. But that's actually a good thing because the universe is not static. The universe is not only expanding, it's also, its, its expansion is also um, accelerating today. And what we know today is that this cosmological constant uh, could be one of the most natural source for the accelerated expansion of the universe. And so dark energy could, in principle, be nothing other than a cosmological constant. Um, there is some level of theoretical wonder of why this cosmological constant would have the order of magnitude that we observe today to explain the level of accelerated expansion that we observe today. And this is that the origin of the cosmological constant problem that we'll discuss about today. So there is between 10 to the 56 and 10 to the 120 orders of magnitude discrepancy between um, the naively anticipated order of magnitude of the cosmological constant we would have expected and the absurd value for this constant. And that's one of the biggest discrepancy, was the biggest discrepancy of, uh, of physics that, that we know of. So if we like the cosmological constant to be the source for uh, dark energy, then we'll need to understand this order of magnitude discrepancy uh, between observations and theoretical anticipations, let's say. <coughs> so nowadays there's many uh, surveys, m many missions, that try to uh, capturize a lot of the physics of what can be making dark energy uh, of today. Uh, in particular, there's some observations, as I said, that lead to uh, the belief that the universe is um, accelerating, not only coming from supernovae, but also coming from other sources. Um, and so there are data from supernovae, as I said, from baryonic acoustic oscillation, from the cosmic microwave background, from galaxy power spectrum, just looking at the, uh, <clears throat> the spectrum of, of uh, galaxies, how many galaxies, mapping the galaxies, from weak lensing, so seeing how the structure in the universe leads to, uh, to weak lensing. And so all of these data, all of this uh, information come in at different scales uh, for the universe. And so give us a lot of information, uh, which is much more than just having one number telling us this cosmological constant is, is of that value. And in particular, we can mimic the equation of state uh, parameter. So if W is exactly equal to minus one, uh, that would correspond to a cosmological constant. We can look at how that parameter would vary as a function of scale, since we have various different probes. Uh, in particular, as a function of scale, we can say as a function of redshift. We use redshift as our notion of time, if you want, or a notion of uh, distance. Um, and so the if, if we just had a cosmological constant, we would have expected uh, this equation of state parameter to be exactly equal to minus one uh, throughout the redshift, so, so throughout the recent history of the universe. But if we combine all of these data that rely on quite different physics, we see that there's actually some 
starting to be some, some chances of evidence for something which is actually much more dynamical. So not necessarily having uh, W being exactly uh, minus one for this uh, region in Z, but something which varies. And if you take into account the errors of these observations, uh, this uh, it looks, at least from this observation, that there's um, something dynamical, which we call dynamical dark, dark energy, is preferred of our cosmological constant at 3.5 sigma level. So 3.5 sigma level, that tells us uh, our, our confidence on how um, likely this measurement is really something physical as opposed to just coming from the statistics or just coming from uh, one chance in uh, 2049 that something like that could have happened. So to put that in other uh, in percentage number, uh, we would think that there's 0.5% uh, chances that this is just a statistical fluke, that there's nothing physical in there. Uh, so if we put it in at that order, many people would think, well, there's something really, some strong physics in, the, in, the, in there. And I'm not an observer, but, but we do know <laughs> that through the history of observation, particularly cosmological observations, uh, it's not the first time that we have the impression to see something at the two sigma level, at the three sigma level. So, so strong evidence for something in the universe and at the end of the day it just comes in from um, the, the fact that all of these measurements are ex extremely complicated to make and, and maybe some of the error bars should be a little bit bigger than, than what we thought they would be. So there seems to be some evidence uh, that um, the uh, dark energy could be dynamical rather than a cosmological constant, but this level of con confidence is not strong enough yet to really determine with, yes? Yes, uh, to, to be honest, I, I, I don't know. I, I, this is, I don't know. I don't know at all. Yeah, this is combined data. For, for the, I'm not at all uh, an observer. I'm, I'm not at all dealing with this data. Yeah. Yeah, so I would, I would recommend, so this is a strong motivation to look at that paper. Okay, so this is just to give you some motivation for starting to look at dynamical dark energy as opposed to a cosmological constant. And that's what we're going to do throughout these uh, four next lectures. So the, the plan of the lectures would be to give you um, some theoretical motivations for looking at dynamical dark energy as opposed to just considering that the evolution of the, the accelerated evolution of the universe is just uh, due to a cosmological constant. So we're going to look at some uh, theoretical motivations and then we're going to go through different type of models of dark energy. Uh, the first uh, few ones that, that came up uh, uh, some 20, 15 years ago, and then we're going to go through a more um, uh, formal classification of the different type of dark energy models that we can think of, particularly based on their level of, uh, of how, they, how they behave within, uh, um, within observations, how, how, they can, um, how they can still be consistent with observations. And there's, of, of course, a thin line between what we mean by dark energy and what we mean by modified gravity, so it's not like a model is... Uh, it's, very, it's always very clear whether we should put it in one category or another category. Uh, but I, I'll still go into something slightly disconnected to the vanilla dark energy type of models, which are more within modified gravity, where we will really start modifying the way the gravitational force behaves, maybe at large distances, or maybe even the way gravitational waves would evolve, and how that may um, modify the way dark energy could uh, um, lead to acceleration of the universe, or maybe even remove the need of dark energy altogether. Uh, so we'll see how, how that goes. Uh, ten, uh, yeah, ten years ago, in 2008, with Andrew Tolley, we gave a summer school on, uh, on dark energy. And at the time, we gave a different classification of the, the different models that people were thinking um, at, at the time, so that was 10 years ago, on whether um, we still believed in GR as being the correct description of gravity on all cosmological distance scales. Um, and then, of course, you could have a, a cosmological constant, you could have back reaction where it's just coming from the structure of the universe leading to uh, an acceleration of the universe, uh, a landscape of uh, different vacua so that there could be some anthropic arguments on selecting uh, 
uh, the different uh, one of the vacua in this uh, in this landscape, we could have dynamical dark energy, and this dynamical dark energy, how it decouples to matter or how it couples to the uh, curvature, would lead to different type of scenarios, either quintessence, which we're going to talk about uh, later today, or brown sticky, or type of f of r modifications of gravity, but it's really gravity in a scalar field that we'll also discuss either later today or, or tomorrow. Or we could have um, more uh, dynamical dark energy, not really from um, an additional degree of freedom separated to the gravitational sector, but really within the gravitational sector itself. And so, for instance, the graviton uh, would not be a spin to massless uh, particle. It could effectively have a mass like a resonance or in different ways through breaking locality or through breaking uh, Lorentz invariance leading to a whole set of different type of uh, models. So that was 10 years ago, and uh, just recently I, I thought, well, that's, that's really now quite old. Uh, just to give you a, a sense of how dynamical this whole field is and how uh, many ideas have come up since then, I just uh, looked at the different models that we have had uh, <laughs> more recently. <laughs> and so I, I, I'm looking forward to seeing what's going to happen in the, <laughs> in the next five years. What's interesting, and I'm not going to talk too much about, is that um, in parallel of development, this <laughs> accelerator rate of <laughs> that type of accelerator rate of, of model, uh, the observations are also doing a pretty good job at discriminating between the different type of, uh, of models. And so there are some uh, current observations that allow us to tell us that some of these models uh, could not any longer play the role for dark energy. But still, we have more and more models uh, that could <laughs> potentially help us understanding what dark energy is, let alone what dark matter uh, could be. So I'm not going to go through all of them uh, in detail, but this is really just to give you a sense uh, of how bubbling this, uh, this field is. And I'll, I'll stop here for the, <laughs> the slides part, and now we're going to go into the, the, the core of the matter. Any questions about this? Yes? Yes? Yeah. Yeah, I think this is the contribution just from, this is just from dark energy. So this is, yeah, th there is some prior assumption coming in there. And uh, exactly, this is one of the key issues in, uh, in, uh, in putting many of this um, data together is that some of them to, be, to being able to extract some information about dark energy, there's some prior which is there already. Um, and a lot of the time what is taken is lambda CDM, so cosmological constant and cold dark matter, to explain the background evolution of the universe and we're trying to extract some of the behavior of dark energy. It's a, so so it's, it's, it's not at all a very clean thing to do where there's a unique answer. There, there's a lot of prior, there's some biases coming in, into the game, yeah. Anything else? Yes? Yes? Oh, uh, yes, that's a good question. Uh, that's a very good question. It looks, <laughs> it looks like a, <laughs> a 10 sigma, no? <laughs> if you put all, uh, all of that together. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, yeah, Do, does anyone know actually? <laughs> Do you know? No? No? <laughs> Each one is three separately? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But all together, I don't know, but it's, uh, it, it, must be, it must be quite a lot. Yeah, I mean, if you just, if you just look at it from the Arab eyes, uh, the, yes, this is, uh, this is one, two, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, one, two, three for each one of them. So one, two, three here, but compared to that, this is, this is huge, yeah, 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 yeah. Anything else? Okay. So, should I have a light here? So the plan is in, um, should be available online. Let me know if it's not the case, and, and um, different dark energy models as well. So we're going to start today with uh, the motivations.
And some of you may already be quite familiar with uh, a lot of what we're going to be doing today, particularly the coincidence problem, the cosmological constant problem, but I think it's good to uh, put everybody at the same level and also to uh, put down the, the, the language we're going to be using for the next uh, three lectures. So we're going to go today through the coincidence problem. And then through the old and new cosmological constant problem. And so these two things are motivations for looking at alternatives of just having a cosmological constant um, as the driver of the accelerated expansion today. So uh, let, let, throughout this, uh, for most of today and tomorrow, we'll be working in four dimensions. This may seem obvious to you <laughs> that we live in three plus one dimension, but uh, we're going to relax this assumption uh, later on this week. And we're working in a minus plus 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 uh, signature. So we have uh, eta mu nu is the diagonal uh, of that in standard um, rectangular coordinates. And, and for most of what we'll be doing, we'll assume Lorentz invariance. assume Lorentz invariance, and a lot of the time we'll assume locality. Okay, yeah. Okay, so let's, let's start by FRW, or FRW, the Friedman, Robert, uh, Robertson, Lemaitre, uh, Walter metric, and I'll just write it including the laps because it will help us deriving the Friedman equation. So I'm not going to derive that for you. Uh, I'm going to work under the assumption that you have all derived that uh, earlier in your life. And then something else that I should have mentioned is that we're going to be working with uh, flat spatial metric. The main reason for that is because we want to um, really focus on the component of dark energy as opposed to uh, the spatial curvature. So this will just be um, for three invariant, just the dx1 squared plus dx2 squared plus dx3 squared. Okay. So if I have this FRW metric and I put it into my Einstein action, so this is my Einstein action, I have an M Planck squared over two, my Riemann curvature, and then I'll have my matter Lagrangian. So this is the matter Lagrangian, and when I say matter, I don't really mean matter and dark matter as, a, as opposed to radiation, uh, as opposed to massless particle. I mean all of the stuff that lives on our space time. So this is all the, all the species that live on our space time. They will be living into this matter Lagrangian. They see a metric G uh, in FRW is given by that. And these are all my species. So this is my action for GR. And now let me work on FRW. So if I have the Einstein scalar curvature on FRW after integration by parts, This is, um, on FRW, this is N A cube. And then if I integrate a few things by parts to remove the time derivatives that would act on my laps N, what we get from here and there is minus 6 A A dot squared over N. So there's an n squared, one of the n squared that comes from here, but then it gets cancelled with one of the n that comes from there. And then from the matter Lagrangian part, plus uh, this thing we will have 
a cube n, like that, and then minus rho of a. So this may not be the way you see it usually, but I'll, I'll derive it like that. So these are all my matter fields, so I there. And then on FRW, I will just assume, well, this just happens to be the case, that the contribution from all the matter fields lead to, uh, are captured by the energy density of every one of these matter fields, which is a function of how the universe evolves, which is captured by the scale factor A. So rho is the energy density of these fields. And at the moment, it really corresponds to the sum of all uh, the matter fields, but we'll specialize on a particular case in a, in a second. So the reason I write it like that is because now we can very easily, just on top of our head, derive the Friedman equation, which you all um, should have seen. In that language, the Friedman equation is nothing other than a constraint. It's a Hamiltonian constraint. A uh, constraint is, let, is derived from a, a Lagrange multiplier. And a Lagrange multiplier here is something which has no, is not dynamical, it has no dot uh, acting on it. It's a little bit more <laughs> concrete than that, but um, that's what we can take at this level. And it's nothing other than the lapse. So if I, we vary this action with respect to the lapse, we get the constraint, which is the Friedman equation. Yeah. At the moment, this is everything. At the moment, this is everything. Everything you can think of, everything that you think should live in our universe, and then we'll focus on special cases. So at the moment, this is the abstract. Huh? We have when there could be everything that you believe is gonna live in your universe, yeah. So, so why do we not have contributions from pressure? Yeah, because this is, this is at the level of the action. So the pressure will come in into how this energy density will, will evolve. But the, in, at, the, at the action, sorry, at the level of the Lagrangian, you've seen that the, the Lagrangian in principle uh, corresponds to the kinetic energy minus the potential. This is just giving you the potential, the, the effective energy density that lives in, into this Lagrangian. Where the pressure comes in into that language is how this evolves. It's an equation of state of, um, of these different fluids. And then to understand how that works out, we will need to categorize between the different ones. Yeah. Yes? Say it again. Including. Including. Yes? I can't hear, sorry. In the metric, yes? Yes? I can't hear. Yes, this is the ADM formalism, yes. Yeah, so N is a lapse. So N is a lapse, this is in ADM. You want this is uh, the lapse. It's, in, uh, it's an FRW uh, ADM, if you want. And this is a scale factor. And the fact, there's an assumption that comes in here, which is uh, actually um, the right thing to do, but the fact that we're just gonna put this assumption into uh, the answer equation, that corresponds to the moduli space approximation. Yes, the integration by parts. Yes, absolutely. So, when I told you this was the action for GR, I lied to you. This is actually not the action for GR. The action for GR is that, plus the boundary terms that would be there to remove precisely this. So in here, what we have is things that involve second derivatives acting on the metric. What we should have been doing, really, is just write this down into first and to um, int do the integration by parts first, this is what the action for GR would be. And then in that formalism, when we have the second uh, derivative acting on a metric in here, we have the 
um, on the boundary, we have the hooking given boundary terms. These are the hooking given boundary terms. This is the action for GR. And so the, when you integrate by parts, the boundary terms precisely cancels those ones so that we don't need to worry about the boundary terms. This is what it should be with these boundary terms. The action for GR is not this thing without the boundary terms. Yeah. Yes? So here I kept uh, some notion of the, of the fact, you've probably set, seen things where you can set the, the, the lapse to one. You've probably seen it like that. And on purpose, I kept the lapse here, uh, not be equal to one, because I can do it, but because also there's a lot of physics involved into this lapse. In particular, we can derive the Freeman equation directly by varying respect to the lapse. It corresponds to a Lagrange multiplier. You can always perform a field redefinition to a new uh, time coordinates so as to set the lapse to one. And this is quite trivial in, in this case. You can always say, well, I don't like to be working with uh, n squared d t squared. I want to be working uh, with a new notion of time where this is equal to minus d t tilde squared, for instance. And so you can easily integrate that out. Whatever function you had in there, you had decided for yourself, you can say now you'll have your d uh, tilde over u dt is equal to n of t. And so you can integrate that out. And in particular, you can work in conformal coordinates uh, so that this is exactly equal to a squared of t. So this may be uh, conformal coordinates. This is not what we want to do today. We want to keep for ourselves for a second just a level of diff invariance or time reparameterization invariance of action because it would allow us to directly derive the constraint and because I'm allowed to do it. Sometimes you set this to one, sometimes you set this to a squared. Just the fact that some people may want to do one thing, some people may want to do the other thing, just gives me a strong motivation for being quite agnostic about it and leave it arbitrary for now, okay? So, now we see that there's no dynamics in this lapse, and so if I vary with respect to this lapse, I'll get my Friedman equation. Here it comes in uh, as an inverse power, and here it comes in as a positive power, so it's quite uh, simple to derive them. Here I'll have a minus sign uh, coming from the fact that it's uh, uh, one over n, so we have this, um, m Planck squared, and then a, a dot squared. And then on the right-hand side, we'll have a cube. Of a. Yeah, sorry, this should have been, I put two minus signs. This is just one minus sign, so this is uh, correct like that. Okay, so let me rewrite this equation as a dot squared over n squared a squared is equal to 1 over 3 m Planck squared rho. Does that remind you of anything, possibly? Yeah, this is the Friedman equation, where this is the Hubble parameter the Hubble parameter squared. So you've probably seen the Hubble parameter without the n in it. Now uh, that we have derived that Freeman equation, we have no more use for n at this level, if it were. I'm allowed to make my change of time, if I want to, to set n is equal to one, if I wanted to. But also you can keep it here. You know that if you choose conformal uh, time, or if you cho choose the physical time, the, the Hubble parameter will have a different level of n in here. 
So sometimes some of you may have seen that the Hubble parameter is equal to A dot over A, or some of you may have seen that the Hubble parameter is equal to A prime over A squared. It's not like we're doing different, different things. We're dealing with different universes. This is exactly the same thing. In one case, N is one, and in the other case, N it has been set to equal to A. We can do either things, and sometimes one time uh, parameterization is better than the other. Anyways, I didn't want to, <laughs> to spend too much time on, on that. So this is the Friedman equation, and if we derive now vary with respect to the scale factor A, we get what is called the Rechardori equation. which kind of tells us how H dot behaves. I'm not going to write it down exactly because we don't, it's not going to be of any relevance for us today. But if you combine this equation with the variation of the Friedman equation, you would end up with the conservation of energy equation, so, which is not independent. which tells us how rho dot behaves. Okay, so this is going to be equal to minus 3h rho plus p. And the pressure comes in here into the variation. So the pressure is related to the variation of the, the energy density. And at this level, so this is, we can put the energy density for all the fluids if we wanted to, and the associated pressure for all the fluids if we wanted to. We're not, we're not going to specify right now what we want, but what we could do is for a particular fluid, we can define the equation of state parameter. Say that the pressure is equal to W times the energy density. And so if we put that here, we'll get that rho dot is equal to minus 3H rho 1 plus W. Pardon? How much can we trust in that last equation? Ah, at the moment, this is an assumption. So, so this I can always write. If it's FRW, I can always write. There's an assumption if, the, if you assume that this is constant. That's why the assumption lies in. If this depends on time, then there's no assumption there, right? Then it's just saying that something that depends on time is related to something else that depends on time. So this, you, we will see different scenarios, okay? So for, for s stating that um, dust or radiation behave, uh, behaves as a perfect fluid with a constant equation of state is a very good assumption. Yeah. Uh, deciding that dark energy is a fluid which behaves with a constant um, equ equation of state parameter, that's not necessarily a very good assumption. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as we see in the W for uh, dark energy may not necessarily be a constant equal to one. Okay, so now if we can look at our cosmological constant. So what we will do right now is just assume that the universe is dominated by a cosmological constant. It doesn't mean that uh, that matter and radiation and standard matter is not present, but we're just going to look at the contribution from a cosmological constant to see what that would do on the evolution of the universe. And in that case, the energy density would be a constant. <laughs> Let's just call it uh, lambda. And then we see directly here that that corresponds to an equation of state parameter equals to minus one for a cosmological constant. And if we put this cosmological constant into the Friedman equation, we get a Friedman equation that tells us that the Hubble parameter is equal to uh, one over three M Planck squared 
rho. Uh, sorry, not cosmological constant, lambda. And so if this is constant, it leads to a constant Hubble parameter. And if lambda is constant, then h is a constant. But recall that h is equal to, uh, let me now set the laps to be 1. If I work in a gauge where the laps is 1, I can always choose my time to do that. Now it'll just be easier. It doesn't change anything if you don't do that. Then we'll have the time variation of the laps, uh, sorry, of the Hubble parameter is 0 is equal to a double dot, dot over a minus d squared minus h squared. And so we see that the acceleration of the scale factor is equal to the constant Hubble, so the constant Hubble parameter, which is positive. So we have an acceleration, an accelerated expansion of the universe. Can you see if I write here? No, okay. So having a cosmological constant leads to the acceleration of the scale factor being positive, and so this is an accelerated expansion. So really, all is good. We observe that the universe expansion is accelerating, and the first thing we can think of, putting a cosmological constant there, leads to an accelerated expansion of the universe. So everything is great, right? <laughs> I have uh, uh, <laughs> five more hours to fill. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so shall we just stop here, or? <laughs> no, okay, so, so a priori this is fine, but there's a few issues that, that, that we'll discuss about. So this is if the universe is dominated by a cosmological constant. Clearly that was and what happened throughout the history of the universe. There was a whole Big Bang history. The universe underwent a period of uh, radiation dominated era and then a period of um, matter domination dominated era. And so let's see how, how the evolution of the universe, how the Hubble or the scale factor would evolve during that period, or the energy the local de energy density. So if we were dominated by by radiation, Do you know how the energy density would behave during the period of the radiation era? Energy density constant. Yes, 1 over a to the 4. So you all seem to be aware of that. I'm not going to go through the derivation of this. And then if we are during the matter-dominated era, then the energy density of that scale with a scale factor. Yeah, okay, very good. So this one is probably the easiest to understand. If it's dust, if you, if you just think of particles, then the, the volume of your box scales like uh, that distance cube, and so the density uh, get uh, reduced by the distance cube. And then uh, for radiation, we have an additional contribution coming from the redshift. So the, the wavelengths uh, get uh, larger as well. And so let me call that a cosmological constant. So if we look throughout the age of the universe, let me put it uh, A here, doesn't matter too much. The total contribution is a function of A to the energy density. So let's imagine we have a total contribution throughout the age of the universe, which is that of radiation that started uh, dominating the universe, but then we see that it gets diluted very quickly. 
uh, matter then then starts to dominate because it uh, gets diluted less quickly, and then the cosmological constant, which remains constant throughout the age, and then maybe there's some spatial curvature, but we have ignored that, so, so let's not go uh, into that. So we'll have to start with some, um, this is how the energy density for radiation would scale, let's say, as one over a to the four. Um, and so since it dilutes more rapidly, there will be a time where it will be subdominant as compared to matter. And so at some point, matter starts uh, taking over. And this still decreases. This is not to scale. <laughs> Don't take me on quote me on that. And then there's a final time where the matter has diluted enough that what starts taking over is the cosmological constant, which has remained constant throughout the age of the universe. So we see that today we're living in a universe where we have roughly 30% of uh, matter and roughly 70% of dark energy. So the amount of matter and the amount of dark energy, even though we're dominated by, um, by a cosmological constant today, they are roughly comparable. So we're living in a region here where roughly the amount of, uh, sorry, of matter is maybe point, uh, I don't know what it would be, um, a few percent, uh, 0.3, it's not quite point 0.3, but let me say roughly like that, of dark energy. So it's roughly of that amount, of the cosmological constant. But throughout the whole history of the universe, this is a very special point. Before that, just before that, we were very much dominated by matter, and before that, we were very much dominated by radiation. And throughout the history of the universe, the cosmological constant has been, be, has been subdominant for almost all of his history, all the way up to today. So how come we happen to be living uh, precisely at the time of our universe where dark matter is roughly of the same order of magnitude as uh, dark energy. Okay, it's not quite the same, but it's not suppressed by 50 orders of magnitude, let's say. Um, when throughout the age of the history, this typically wasn't what was happening. Dark, dark energy was very subdominant throughout the age of the, of the universe. So this, the fact that we're precisely living in that sweet spot corresponds to the coincidence problem. Whether or not you think this is an issue may depend on your taste. I'm going to remain agnostic about that, but some people have developed some models to try to explain the co coincidence problem, and so I'm just going to review them. It may or may not be something that you consider an issue. You may think, well, maybe that's just a question of scale as well. If I change my, if I change my axis there, I can make that a little bit bigger, I can make that a bit smaller. <laughs> Who is to judge? Uh, but I'm going to remain agnostic, okay? This is one of the motivations that people have been um, considering to, 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 to study models of dark energy, where instead of having something which has been constant and very small and very subdominant throughout the age of the universe, maybe it would have tracked the, uh, the energy density of radiation and maybe later the energy density of matter so that there's no coincidence in the fact that we almost at the same level of dark matter and dark energy today. So that's the essence of the uh, coincidence problem and the motivation for looking at tracker solution, which I'll briefly uh, mention, uh, maybe. So I'm going much slower than, <laughs> than I thought I would. What I'd like to do now is look at the cosmological constant problem. which to my mind is a much uh, deeper issue, but um, it may be a question of, of, of uh, taste. So the cosmological constant problem is coming up when we're looking at the numbers. 
We've seen that if we have a cosmological constant, it leads to the acceleration of the universe. The Hubble parameter today, H today, is what? Put a zero here to say it's today, as opposed to inflation. Or... Yeah, 70. 70 kilometers per second, and then per megaparsec. So if a supernova was one, mega, one megaparsec away from us, it will move on average uh, at a, with, a, with a velocity of uh, 70 kilometers per second, which is uh, pretty fast. If we put that back into energy scale, so I'll be working in units where h bar is equal to the speed of light is equal to one. So that means that a scale of energy is equal to a scale of mass, and that's the inverse as a scale of distance, and uh, a speed is dimensionless. This is roughly 10 to the minus 33 electron volt. Sorry? Ah, yes, thank you, thank you, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you, yeah, yeah, <laughs> thank you, yeah. So if you compare with the energy scales that we're used to dealing with when we at the LHC, for instance, what's the typical energy scale at the LHC? TV, yes, yeah, the Higgs mass, the mass of the Higgs, is roughly 125 giga electron volt. So that's uh, roughly 10 to the nine, giga is nine, and then uh, 10, 11 electron volt. This is pretty small as an energy scale compared to, to that. Even for the neutrinos, if they have a mass, it's of the order of milli electron volts, so 10 to the minus three electron volts. There's still 30 orders of magnitude difference between the scale we're talking about here and the standard particle physics scale. Um, okay, so that in principle uh, would be okay if um, we hadn't had the, 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 the prior that um, from a field theory perspective, any field that, we leave, that lives on our space-time, if it has a mass, would naturally contribute to uh, a vacuum energy, which is constant, which acts like a cosmological constant, but with an order of magnitude which scales, at the very least, like the mass of this particle to the power of four. So we would expect contribution to lambda that go like 10, uh, like the mass of the particle to the power four for every particle of mass m. So for instance, the Higgs has a mass of around 125 giga electron volt. We would expect it to give a contribution to the cosmological constant, and therefore to give a contribution to uh, the rate of the acceleration of the universe today, which would scale like its mass to the power four, and then we'll have to divide by the Planck square, but still we have something which is much larger than what we're observing uh, today. To put that more concretely, we can do two things. I'll just give you some incentive to do a calculation and then uh, I'm not gonna carry it through because it would take us uh, an hour. But what you can do is have a look at uh, gravity and a scalar field. It doesn't need to be a scalar field necessarily. You can take fermions, you can take a vector field. It doesn't matter too much, but it'll be much easier if you do it with a scalar field than if you do it with anything else. So let's imagine you have your action for GR, which is M Planck squared over two and the scalar curvature, and then you put a scalar field, minus a half. Let me put it, this is the inverse metric, d mu phi, d nu 
phi for your scalar field minus V of phi. So this scalar field couples to gravity. It sees gravity through this factor here and through this factor there. So there's an interactions between gravity and your scalar field. Yes? Yes? Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. Yes, let me show you. Yeah. So you can have a look at that. Let, let's see. Uh, you could take just a massive scalar field. So that's where the mass comes in. What you can do is do perturbations on flat space time. And it would be easier, this is just a trick that you can use, it would be easier if you usually you write a perturbation like so, one over h mu nu of m Planck, right? Typically you write things like that. I can, if I'm just gonna do perturbation, if this is small, it's actually easier if I do it, if I wrote it like that. For this calculation, where this h square mu nu is h mu nu h, uh, sorry, h mu alpha, h nu beta, eta alpha beta. So this is just a change of variables. Let me write it like that. Doesn't matter too much. Then what you could do is expand this uh, scalar curvature, or this Einstein term in here, in fluctuations in there. What you would get at leading order is h mu nu, well, let me just do it exactly. We'll have uh, square root minus g and Planck squared over 2 r. This is actually equal to leading order to 1 over 4 h mu nu epsilon alpha beta mu nu h alpha beta. Where this is the Lichnado rates operator. And that has been, uh, we have done integration by parts here. So this is a symmetrization factor. I'm working with a convention that if I have two symmetrized indices, that corresponds to a half d, uh, sorry, a mu nu plus a nu mu. There's actually a two here. And then plus d mu d nu h, where h is a trace of h mu nu. So you take h mu nu and you contract it with uh, eta mu nu. And then we have minus eta mu nu box h minus d alpha d beta h alpha beta. So that's not very important for us right now, but we'll use it uh, later on for, this lecture, uh, for these lectures. Okay, so this is the Can you read in here? That's okay? Yeah? Okay. Uh, so this we will be using later. All you have to remember is that this has second derivatives on h mini. It will give you what the propagator, but we're not gonna look too much at what happens from that. What we want to look at is the communication, is the, con the coupling between your scalar field phi, your massive scalar field phi, and your metric. So if you look at this thing here, and you have square root minus g minus a half uh, d phi squared minus a half m squared phi squared. If you're living in a metric like that, 
that will correspond to a coupling between little h mu nu and your scalar field that goes like h mu nu over m Planck t mu nu. This is the at leading order, this is the stress energy tensor associated with your scalar field if you were to live on flat space time. And then you have an infinite number of corrections that come in here. So this is the first order term. Then you have something that goes like h mu nu, h alpha beta over m Planck squared, t mu nu alpha beta, etc. So what I'm not putting in here is things which would scale like m h cube. Um, so you have contributions like that. At leading order, this t mu nu is the stress energy tensor for your scalar field if you were to live on flat space time. You can't read here, right? Can everybody here read? No, okay. So what is that? It's a d mu phi, d nu phi, minus, if it's living on flat space time, it's theta mu nu, a half d phi squared, plus the potential, in our case, the potential is a half m squared phi squared. So at this level, you don't even need to think too much about quantizing your, vector, your tensor field h mu nu. And in principle, this is a quantum uh, field h mu nu. But your scalar field is also a quantum field. We're living quantum field theory. Type coupling h mu nu, t mu nu, and h mu nu, h alpha beta, t mu nu alpha beta, etc. they will lead to corrections to, uh, or they, they, you can look at Feynman diagrams associated with that. And so from that, you have an h mu nu coupled to two phi's. I can construct from that a diagram where I have an h mu nu as an external leg, and then a loop of matter, a loop of phi field. You have a phi living in here from these two phi in here, or in here, or in there. Have that. And, uh, but you not only have this type of interaction, you also have interactions uh, with two H's, um, and interactions with three H's and four H's and everything. So you have in total contribution to, uh, from looking at one loop, contribution of the scalar field on what is your graviton, or your tensor mode, h mu nu, that goes like that. Then you have something that goes like this, where you have a loop of phi. So this is coming from an interaction like that in here, or that vertex, and an interaction like that at that vertex. But you also have something that goes uh, from here. So two h's connecting to two phi's in here. So that's going to give a contribution in the one loop effective action for H. You integrate out the one loop of phi, the contribution on H effectively, so on, on the effective action for H, that will have to scale like H. What we mean by that is the trace of H plus corrections. So if I just look at the low energy limit of this contribution, and what I mean by that is if this external leg for H mu nu had um, zero momentum, or in the limit where they would have zero momentum, the contribution to this one loop effective action will go like that. And it would scale, if you look at this one loop of the scalar field, it will scale like roughly the mass of the particle to the full at the very least. 
If you put a cutoff for your particle, you will have something that would scale it with even larger amount, but at the very least, it would scale like that. From this contribution, you would have something that would go like h squared minus h squared. What we mean by that is h mu nu h mu nu. This is, this is a trace of the square of that tensor. And then this is the trace h squared. The trace of h is what we wrote here. So it's h mu nu, min, uh, h mu nu minus h alpha alpha h beta beta. You see that this would contribute something running. So there would be a, a log running. Uh, if you put a uh, if you work in beam rag, you would have a scale associated with this running, and I don't want to go too much into that right now. But I'd like you to see that you'll have contribution that would scale like this, and contribution that would scale like that. And this is a calculation I recommend you do it, so that you, you see uh, what you really get. By working in that language, if you were to do all of this sum of loops, so you'll have something with just one H, something with two H's, something with three H's, I would come in here. What you would have had there is something that would go like m to the 4 and then h cube minus 3 h h squared plus 2 h cube. The square brackets are the traces of the tensors. So if I have a tensor m mini, The square bracket of a tensor menu is the trace of that tensor. So, for instance, m to the 26 is you multiply, you have this thing, to, this matrix to the 26, and then you take that. You want it, so. Et cetera, 26 times. You'll have that. You can go to quartic order. So you have something that goes like that, plus something with three and one, and then something with that. You could go and compute those exactly and you would get something that would go like h to the 4, and then a particular combination. So why do I go through all of that? Is that if you do this calculation, you would actually see that it would truncate exactly at that order. If you go to any higher order, the result vanishes at low energy. It vanishes exactly and what I mean by low energy is if the uh, momentum associated with the external leg for your H mu have zero momentum, then the contribution for any higher contribution to the one loop effective action of your, of your graviton would be exactly zero. So it truncates at that order and then if you were to look at the contribution from this, from that, from that, and then from here, what you would get is exactly what a Kosmoschkal constant is in that language. So if you are working in that language, to all orders in H, what is square root minus G? So you could check it out, but it's one plus the trace of H of a Planck plus the trace of H squared minus H squared of M Planck squared. Then you have exactly that cubic interaction. Then you have a quartic contribution, and then that's it. It stops at that order.
at cubic order, and then at something at quartic order. And then it stops. Yes? Yes, yes. The scale factor? Yeah, so, yeah, so we're working about flat space time indeed. Yeah, so you can do that, but here, here you're working around flat space time, so there's no scale factor. So you just get one? Yes, exactly. You just get one? You just get one, exactly. So the square root to minus g here? Yeah, give you one. Yeah, so this contribution gives you one. And then from these perturbations, yes. it gives you this, these four terms. Uh, so you have not then yeah, it stops. It stops here. This is the way I write my metric, and it, in the, I write it like that so it's an exact squared, yes. so that I can write it as h mu nu plus h mu nu of n Planck squared. And so that when I take the square root, it only gives me a finite number of terms. I think, but if you include it, you might find a lot of terms cancel out. That's why I was wondering, that's what I did. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. So this is, this is my whole metric. Yes. Whatever the metric is, no matter how complicated, I can always write it down like that. <laughs> always. Yeah. This is just, at that level, it would just be a fair definition, definition. But of course, we're working under the assumption that it's small fluctuation living in flat space time, and so this would be small. And so at leading order, it doesn't matter whether you want to work with h mu or h square mu, but I would say it's a good choice to be working with that so that the whole expansion of the determinant of the metric, the square root, truncates at a finite order. Yes, yeah. So that you can plug in here, and you will see that it's exactly that. But what you see is that the contribution from the one loop of your scalar field of mass m, if you sum all of that, it's all of these terms, but there's a finite number of terms that you need to con consider, they would resum to give you precisely these contributions. Precisely that. And then with a scale in front of it, which is associated with the mass of that scalar field. We're just dealing with a scalar field here for simplicity. So the one loop effective action for that scalar field contribution to um, how the, what, the, what the, the graviton sees, really, is something that looks like a cosmological constant. It's exactly a cosmological constant. It has all of these terms. So I haven't written them, those one here and those one there, but you could check and it correspond exactly to this one and exactly to that one. Not up to a factor of two or anything. Exactly, really exactly. And so the contribution that you have from, at that level, a scalar field of mass m in the low energy limit, so in the limit where the momentum of the external leg goes to zero, is exactly a cosmological constant. So the one loop effective action by integrating out matter fields gives you precisely a cosmological constant, and the scale associated with that cosmological constant is related to the mass of the scalar field. So by integrating out, I could do it um, more probably if I, if I have, um, if I were, um, let me do it in Euclidean. The one loop for my graviton, if I consider that to be the integration of uh, my scalar field, I put a minus here because I want to be in Euclidean just for a second, it'll be easier to make the, the argument is the integration of that dr plus the scalar field. If I were to integrate out at one loop, I would get a contribution which goes like a cosmological constant, which is just square root minus g, scaled by the mass of the field to the power four, and then you have a log running, let's say over m, 
and then corrections that come in from momentum of the external legs, and these corresponds to derivatives acting on the metric, and that they would have to repackage into something which is covariant, which is, for instance, uh, a curvature term with some scale in front of it, maybe an M squared uh, in front of it, and then an R mu nu, R mu nu squared, uh, and this type of corrections. So this, they're gonna be not important as compared to the contribution that you already have in GR with scales like, like the power and Planck, to, and Planck squared, which is gonna be bigger than that. So that's not very important. But what we see is that this corresponds to an effective cosmological constant that scales like the mass of the particle to the power of four. Of course, it's not an accident that we get something that repackages exactly as a cosmological constant because of covariance. Whatever the result should have been, it would have ended up being covariant. So the only thing we could have had is something which is a cosmological constant. But it's good to do it once um, just for uh, to, to, to know that we're not trying to sell you something which doesn't quite work like that. Um, and to see that the scaling when you complete the loop would actually go like, at the very least, the mass of the particle to the four, um, if not higher if you had put a, another um, type of regularization, like cutoff regularization or something like that. So you get at least a power m, m to the four contribution like, that scales like m to the four if you're doing dimensional regularization. So I think I'm out of time, is that right? I'm running, yeah, I'm sorry about that. So, yeah. Yeah, so, so that, that tells you how the graviton is gonna um, contribute to the, to the effective action for your scalar field. But actually this is very suppressed because it's implying corrections as compared to the scalar field uh, propagation. So you could consider that as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you want to have external legs of the scalar field in here? Pardon? For the graviton loop, yeah, you want to have an external leg of the scalar field in here? Yes. Quartic uh, graviton legs, yes. So you can consider as well. Or you can consider a diagram like that with just a scalar leg or something like that with a scalar leg on top of it. That's gonna correspond to, con to modifications on things like that. So, but it's just gonna be M Planck corrections to that, to what you already have, yeah. So, so at the level of, I mean, here we're only integrating out, the, the, we, uh, we only consider a loop of the scalar field and only graviton external legs because that's the question we're interested in. But you could look at what the corrections are for, from that, and so you, you integrate out only the internal uh, graviton and scalar field. You could do that. Th that. That is gonna lead to corrections to that, but which are not very relevant for the question we want to answer. Yeah, so definitely you're gonna start generating things which are corrections to this, but you're always gonna ha have at least a, one graviton external leg, so it's gonna be always M Planck suppressed. GR here uh, in uh, what is not renormalizable? Uh, the whole approach that you showed because it looks like you have too many legs in some diagrams. I mean. No, so this is perfectly renormalizable. This, this, this is, we're just doing um, effective field theory. We're just working very at energy scale, very low compared to the Planck scale. And at that level, I, I can, these are the contribution I, I get. And depending on, here I'm, I'm working in the one loop effective uh, picture, so I'm integrating out, this is the contribution I get. If you want it instead, you could think of, uh, this gives you some uh, divergences, you want to add counter terms to remove these divergences, and perturbatively, order by order, I can do that. There's absolutely no issue. So yeah. That's right, it's only if you want to consider the effective field theory of gravity at a scale comparable to the cutoff, to the Planck scale, that then we'll ha start having issues. But perturbatively at low energies, there's absolutely no issues. Yeah, yeah.
Yes, in principle you could do that. So in principle you could do that. But then that means that what you end up having, well, the, to cancel that thing, you will need to have an extremely tuned, uh, you, you need to have two huge numbers put them together uh, with an extremely tuned accuracy but to cancel. Also, comes with a So you could in principle, yes, you could in principle just remove it away. Yes, but in, in field theory, usually when you have something which is of that order of magnitude, uh, you, you have something which is of that order of magnitude, you, you expect it to be there. When you, when you, at this level, you're just computing the one loop effective action. So you haven't decided that your action for GR would be exactly that suppressed from all the particles and then you're going to integrate over all the particles and get the contribution so as to remove it. Usually you have a leftover which is of the same order of magnitude. Because you will need to do that for the one loop and then you'll have a similar contribution coming at two loops and at three loops, etc. So you will need to know precisely what the contribution from all the particles from all the loops would be to decide precisely what contribution you should have had put on into your bare Lagrangian that would have removed all of these contributions a priori. So in principle, yes, you could do it, but, but usually from, a, from an effective field theory point of view, that's not, that's not quite what happens. You, you, you have something which is of the same order of magnitude. You have a running of that um, co contribution. Uh, okay. Can I suggest to continue the discussion during the break? Because it's already late. Uh, let's thank Claudia. Uh,